She is the author of five critically acclaimed novels. She was born in Amritsar and received her master's degree from Dalhousie University in Halifax, Canada, and her MPhil from Delhi University, where she also taught English literature at Miranda House for 25 years. All her novels revolve around women's lives, and she has a gift for portraying their hopes and their aspirations um, against the complexities and daily pressures of traditional society and the exigencies of modern India. Uh, uh, all her novels have been uh, shortlisted for major literary awards, including uh, Difficult Daughters, which is the also gives the title to this session, uh, and it was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers' Prize in the Eurasian region. Another of her shortlisted books includes um, A Married Woman, which she will also be uh, talking about, and um, her fourth novel, The Immigrant, was uh, shortlisted for the DSC Prize. Her uh, most recent work, her fifth novel, Custody, about a legal battle between a married couple, or a divorce couple rather, and their children, is to be turned into a 270 episode series for uh, television. Um, Hi, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, and uh, part of the reason I'm pleased to be here is that my first novel is set in Amritsar and Lahore. And 20 years ago, I visited Lahore in order to research parts of it. And I've always wanted to say something about this book here in Lahore. And today I've got an opportunity, and I'm really, really pleased about this. I haven't stopped smiling since <laughs> the day I came. Um, so I'll read a passage that uh, revolves around my earlier research in Lahore. And it's not, it's not a passage I read in India, because in India I'm more, a little more focused on the story. But I can't help myself being here. I have to read this. It, it, it's not that interesting, but still it, it's interesting to me. Uh, going to Lahore is not easy. It takes me two months. The queues in the visa section are long. The atmosphere between the two countries, as usual, hostile. When I finally arrive, I understand the look in people's eyes whenever there is talk of the famous city. It is clean, leafy, cool, and beautiful. The institutions I visit are massive, ornate, touched by Gothic. And I am in love with everything between the sky and the grass from my very first hour there. As for the people, I had never seen so many good-looking ones, so many good-looking ones together. I look at them possessively, a Punjabi Hindu hunger in my eyes, a hunger about a region I'd hardly thought about until I thumbed through the pages of people's memories and saw my questions as a bookmark in their leaves. And the Oxford of the East, I saw Government College Lahore first from the road. I walk up an incline towards it and look at the Gothic spire narrowing into the sky, a superb statement of its colonial heritage. This place must have been something in its heyday. Students dressed in maroon blazers and gray pants pass me as I wander around full of lust and longing, my eyes glassy with desire for the best shot to imprint upon my film, certain I would fail to capture the ultimate vision. I walk reverently through a narrow arched corridor leading into the inner courtyard, not quite a courtyard because one side is bordered by a path with wide serene stone steps sloping down to an open air theater. Beyond and below, I can see the boys' hostel. Yellow leaves fall on the students who are pacing up and down the path in front, open books held before them. I climb the stairs flanking the library into a gallery with classrooms on either side, enter one, slide into an aisle bench, and put my arms on the wooden table in front. This is where my mother sat and waited out the periods of time that fate had 
had employed to divide her from her married life. Here she faced the black robe professor and tried to concentrate on what he was saying. Here her eyes fastened on the two fans, whirling on their long poles suspended from the rafters. Here she gazed at the peaked ventilators and the tops of the green trees beyond the veranda. I drink in all these details. I do it, take photographs of every turn in the staircase, the corridors, the classrooms, outer and inner aspects, knowing I may never be able to come again. So that's the, and just one little thing, uh, it's, it's towards the end of the book, so I don't want to read too much, but it's the Lahore Assembly on 2nd March, 1947. And this is just the end of it. And, uh, I talk about reading uh, 10 years of newspaper on microfilm. This was the Tribune that was published from Lahore. And uh, you know, reading it, I just felt uh, my heart in my mouth and seeing history so vividly, I can almost not stand it. I must be calm. I must be able to scan newspaper headlines with hands that do not tremble. The past has happened. Hundreds and thousands of screams have been uttered. But those deaths I'm so scared of created seeds that scattered through the wind and settled in all parts of the country, waiting restlessly under the earth, dormant but not extinct. And if I stare these facts in the face, I cannot go, because I feel threatened by lawlessness and bloodshed. History makes me insecure. I'm glad I'm not a historian. And uh, all the research I did about typical daughters, you know, pages and pages of notes and interviews and history books and visits to all these places. I put in my book, I took them out, it was originally twice its length. I was told, you're not a historian, you're a fiction writer. So I took them out, but somewhere uh, when I said that these, these seeds lie dormant under the earth, they manifest in this incident of the Babi Masjid, which you must have heard of, that took place on December 6, 1992. And my second novel is around that incident, uh, which I felt was a terrible blot, on, you know, in our nation's history that we should actually have gone and done this. And so all those feelings of despair about, you know, and this anxiety about when will Hindus and Muslims ever come together uh, is there in, it's there somewhat in this first book, but it's there a lot more in my second, where the protagonist is an activist. So the research of this book, as I said, split into the, into the second. And though I write about families and about women and families, I also uh, take in, you know, the political events around me, because I feel that, you know, the two are interlinked. Whether you write about family or whether you write about one impacts the other. And uh, so this is my approach to, and to, to my fiction writing. And sometimes I quite object to being called a woman writer because I feel that's marginalizing or somehow, you know, de uh, denigrating the issues that not only I, but other women write about. And I think it's important to say this. I say I'm a feminist writer. And I say feminism is important because women's lives can't be separate from you know, lives that you consider more mainstream or more out there in the public. Because we are formed in our homes, men and women alike. And the attitudes that we imbibe, we imbibe in our homes when we are very young and they're brought to our homes from the outside. So I feel it's important to say this and also because I've been a teacher most of my life, the kind of uh, text and context is something that we study and that is implicit in my novels. So, so the, the question I um, wanted to ask you was, uh, this book, The, the Difficult Daughters, is actually kind of partly drawn on your mother's wife, uh, life, I mean. Um, <laughs> And it, it, you know, so young woman as, as a struggle against traditional and self empowerment. But what I just suggested the prop, I'm going to give you three questions. One, word. and the other thing was you came to the hall to research it. And what was the difference between the reality of the hall and the hall in your head when you sort of uh, uh, handle these themes? 
Yeah, okay, the second one first. You know, I had written the whole novel before I, I came to the horror. And uh, uh, the horror sections, I had read about it and, you know, looked at old maps and I had the Tribune. But this kind of detail that I read at the Government College of Lahore, being able to describe it, I could only do after I came. And the fact, so then after I came, I only had a visa for three days. So I had all these lists of places that I had to see. I hired a taxi and I hit the road with my notebook first thing and I was, you know, because partly because of the planes, there was only a plane twice, or whatever. So, um, so I hit the road with my notebook. Everybody I met was extremely friendly. Many people invited me to make my home in Lahore, which delighted me. <laughs> so I could put it. So I went back and I rewrote all those Lahore sections with the kinds of details that uh, that uh, I, I read. Now, how I came to write this? Uh, I started writing in uh, after the birth of my last kid, and you know, when I was already in my 40s, I was 41 or two when I started writing. And I started writing because an ambition seized me at this late stage in my life that I didn't want to be only the, a mother and a wife and a teacher. I wanted something more. And this was post Salman Rushdie. And I think post Salman Rushdie, everybody, every literate educated person in India took up a pen and said they were going to write a novel. And I'm afraid I was one of them. <laughs> And I did try and write in a somewhat rusty esque style to discover sadly that that was not my style. I just sounded very inauthentic and false writing like that. So it took me a while to find my voice. It also took me a while to find my story. Because when I started, I started writing about somewhat autobiographically about, you know, a woman divorced. Well, I wasn't divorced, but a lecturer. I was a lecturer. Uh, why is she so miserable? Why is she so sad? I mean, I was that sad and miserable, that's for sure. <laughs> so, what made her the way she is? So, uh, I wrote about 80 pages in the present volume, that's about two. I wrote about 80 pages of that. And then I said, this isn't getting me anywhere. I have to look at her mother's life. And to look at her mother's life, I drew upon my own mother's life. And this was just a whole... It was a very rich uh, mind there. And by the time I finished with my mother's life and her mother's life, I had written 170,000 words. And I thought, I can't come back to this woman now. <laughs> She's too marginal. <laughs> so that's how I started. It was really hit and miss. I had no idea of what I was going to write until I was actually doing it. And even in the writing process, and that's the way I still write. And I think that's very wasteful, but I can't do anything else. I just go on writing until I reach a block. And when I reach a block, I kind of retrace and go another way. It's rather like a river, dam, this way, that way. You, the river tries to find its flow, and I try to find my words and my story. So that's really how I write. And as I think, I often wish I could write in another way, because I would save so much time. But, you know, I have tried and I, I can't write in another way. So that's how I came to write my mother's story. Every relative of mine in Amritsar whom I did interview were very disapproving. <laughs> and they didn't want their daughters to read it in case it gave them ideas. <laughs> and they didn't want their daughters in law to read it in case it gave them even more ideas. I feel totally delighted. I, 
I'm a teacher of Jane Austen, so uh, why would I not be delighted? Yes, you know, in fact, I often think of Jane Austen because I myself have been not quite accused, but you know, sometimes I think, or I've been told, nothing happens in your books, and then immediately I think of Jane Austen. You don't, things don't have to happen in that way. You don't have to have a whole lot of spectacular events because the novel is, after all, about our inner lives. And it's about, you know, it's about your inner lives in a social context. So of course it's about society, but it's about, you know, the two meeting each other. And that's what the novel is all about, and that's how it's written, that's how it grows in India, first of all in Bengal, that's how it grows in Britain, uh, first of all in London, then had an urban centre in Bengal, when there was this Bengal Renaissance. And so, when people come across situations against which there is a kind of a block, that's why, you know, I write about women trying to negotiate their family lives, their domestic lives, the, the uh, constraints, the demands of people who love them, and they love these people also. They want to please them. And yet there is also this great need to realize yourself which often means a clash, either with the outside world, which is represented by, you know, in the family, by patriarchal assumptions, by assumptions that women have to stay at home and mind the children and shut up. So, and, and uh, my women don't want to shut up. But how do they raise their voices without destroying, you know, their homes or, or the, the domestic fabric? So this is what I find very enabling. And, you know, everywhere I look around me, there is a story. I think it's very, it's fascinating to be living in the subcontinent now because there's so much to say. I feel, you know, I've just finished my sixth novel. I have the seventh and eighth already planned. I mean, wherever I look in people's lives, whether they're domestic, uh, they're domestics or whether they're my students or whether, whatever class it is, there is, you know, this great uh, upheaval now. I mean, I know India, so I talk about the Indian context. There, there is this great upheaval of people wanting more, of women wanting more, not being satisfied, and they're getting more also. But of course, there's a price to pay, and I talk about that price. Well, you mentioned your novel, The Married Woman, where you look at the Babri Masjid. Uh, you see, when you look at the uh, Hindu Muslim, you know. But actually, you subvert, I think, you subvert the whole um, thing of, um, you know, society, both Hindu and Muslim, because it, it revolves around the relationship between two women, <laughs> you know. It does. Yes, could you talk about that, how did that kind of... Well, when I was writing A Married Woman, that's the name of this book that has the Bobby Mazda at the center of it, I wanted to, I guess maybe because I've been an academic for so many years, I start uh, my novels not with a storyline, but with an idea. So, and it may or may not illustrate that idea, but, and, and a married woman doesn't. But the idea behind the married woman was how women, uh, you know, support each other, how they're each other's lifelines. And but when I was writing, this is very boring to write about the friendship between two women. I mean, I thought there was nothing much to say. So then I made it sexual. So <laughs> they're lovers. <laughs> so then I had a lot to say. <laughs> so so that, that's how it came about, you know, the, this. Uh, and in fact, well, you have to read the book to find out what happened to this relationship. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, please switch your cell phones off or put them on silent at the very least. The first three rows are reserved for delegates and sponsors. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I'm going to ask my last question and then, then I'll open it up. Oh, so it was sometimes or has it been, um, well, it's about in custody, which is, which is, a, which is a really wanting story. It's about a couple and they, they, they split up and then uh, then they vie for the affection of their children. And then finally they go into legal battle where they all have to say these terrible things about each other. And can you tell me about custody and how it turned, uh, and how it became 
a television series, a wildly popular book, and I think 270 episodes, I think that's really wow. Even I thought that, and I said, you know, I've written these books, but I don't think there's material for 270 episodes in it. And, uh, and Ekta Kapoor, Balaji Telephones, I don't know whether you've heard of her, but Ekta Kapoor, who met me, assured me that, it, you know, it didn't have enough material and they were going to make up a lot. And I had to be prepared for that. And also that Indian TV audiences being what they are, we can't show an extramarital affair. I'm really <coughs> sorry, but... Uh, <laughs> I mean, you would think that this was not news, but anyway, <laughs> that uh, India could take a TV serial about an extramarital affair, but apparently they couldn't. So anyway, so she was going to redo the whole thing. So it's very strange for me watching this film because it's familiar and not familiar at the same time. It's a bit like being in Pakistan or in the war. It's familiar and not familiar at the same time. So. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so when I wrote Custody, I set it in post-liberalization India, which is post-1990s, which is when we saw this huge e economic spurt and growth and, you know, a change in lifestyles in many, in many families. And along with this change came this notion that if you didn't like your husband, you didn't have to live with him. Now, this was seen as new and modern. And, uh, well... Uh, well, I've been asked many times, you know, are you advocating divorce? I don't know what to say to that. I mean, I'm certainly advocating, you know, empowerment. If that leads to divorce, I'm not advocating you have to stay with your husband if he's nasty, cruel, and beats you up. I'm not saying you have to be married no matter what the cost. But I'm also not saying that you should run off and leave your husband at the drop of a hat. You know, I am for personal choice. That's what I'm for. Whatever place it takes, that's what I'm for. Sadly, <laughs> so, we seem to be out of time. Have I got, have I got time for one question? Uh, one question, please, I can take. Okay. Uh, anyone got a question? Yes?